going to do a little uh, 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 overview of what we have going on today. Uh, for everyone in the room, I'm Liz Mara. I'm the Communications Director in the Multnomah County District Attorney's Office. Uh, and we're here today with a number of folks who are going to talk about a new domestic violence uh, survivor centered diversion program. We have a short amount of remarks, about maybe 10 minutes, and then we'll have about 20 minutes for Q&A from media, and we have a hard stop at 10.30 today. So I will ask everyone to be on mute, uh, and when we get to the, unless you're speaking, and then when we get to the Q&A portion, uh, we'll use the raise your hand function. So with that, we're ready to get started, and I'm going to turn it over to DA Mike Schmidt. Looks like Lillian has a question. Sorry, just <clears throat> wondering if there was going to be a recording because I can't do it from my end. Oh, you know what? Uh, let me do let me do that. If everyone can just bear with me because I yes, hold on one second. All right, so now we'll turn it over to DA Mike Schmidt. All right, well, thanks everybody for being here today. Uh, excited to tell you about our new program that we're ready to launch. Uh, in October of last year, we announced with the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys who are here today, that we were selected as a site for establishing a diversion program for criminalized survivors of domestic violence. Today, I'm pleased to share that our program is ready to launch. Addressing domestic violence is critically important and the top priority for me in my office. Despite welcome declines in reported crime last year, we continue to see high rates of domestic violence with a disproportionate impact on underserved communities. We also know that the vast majority of women who are incarcerated are survivors. A recent survey of women at Coffee Creek Correctional Facility found that 65% of respondents were experiencing intimate partner violence at the time of their arrest. When we support uh, domestic violence survivors and work with them to meet their needs, we can save lives. That's why we took the opportunity to work with APA and our partner, Bradley Angle, who's also here today, uh, on this new program. The goal is to provide community-based services in lieu of traditional prosecution for defendants who are survivors of domestic violence. In practice, what that means is our office will identify defendants who are survivors of intimate partner violence and divert them away from criminal prosecution and instead connect them to services at Bradley Angle to address underlying trauma. This is in recognition of the fact that when survivors' needs go unmet, they adapt to survive, and at times in ways that further negatively impact their lives and may result in interactions with law enforcement and the justice system. And by connecting survivors with services and addressing their needs, we can create healthier families and safer communities. We chose Bradley Engel as our service partner because they are experts in domestic violence, and we also have a long-standing, trusted working relationship with them. We have co-located with them at the Gateway Center for Domestic Violence Services, and they have been working closely with us for nearly the past five years on our Violence Against Women Act grant. Critical to the launch of this program was the planning that work that took place over the past several months. We are using a similar program in King County as a model, and we're incredibly grateful for the guidance that we've received from the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office and the YWCA of Seattle King County, both here with us today. I'm pleased to continue our partnership with Bradley Angle and with the launch of this new program, I'm incredibly grateful for the support of the APA and King County. Together, we will be able to better meet the needs of survivors and their families in our communities. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to David Laban, our president of the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys, APA. Well, thank you, District Attorney Schmidt. Uh, my name is David Laban I'm, and I'm the uh, president and CEO of the National Association of Prosecuting Attorneys. Uh, Mike had referred to us as APA. That is that is our uh, shorter uh, name on this. Uh, so we, we were very pleased, and it's actually been a little over two years ago, to apply to the Department of Justice Office of Victims of Crime to look and say, what can we do for the survivors of intimate violence who ultimately themselves become criminalized or become defendants in cases? And uh, Mike's office was one of 18 that competed uh, to see who, who is interested in working this program. As he already suggested, this follows uh, the hard work of the King County Prosecutor's Office and their relationships with, with the YWCA, uh, as, as was shared. And we're so pleased to be here for the kickoff of those offices. Uh, two were selected, 
And we have one East Coast and one West Coast. And uh, obviously, we're all here because uh, Portland, with their long history of looking and thinking about not only what has happened in the community, but how can you address it better and reduce the violence. So Portland uh, was one, Nashville was, was the other that, that was uh, selected. Uh, a piece of the selection was to work with the community, work with the, uh, the, the nonprofits. Bradley Angle, is, as we saw from, from afar, appeared to be a perfect uh, partner in this. And the, very, the difference of when you talk about a diversion or deflection program, and for some uh, reporting on this, a lot of programs are heavily controlled by the courts of what, what an individual needs to do or not do, whether or not their case gets dismissed. But the design of this program is to put true trust and get the individual back and referred to the community. And that's exactly what D.A. Schmidt and his office has done with their partner, Bradley Engel, who's a 501c3 nonprofit. It's truly a community-based uh, effort to address the violence. With me is Aviva Koresh, uh, she's a licensed clinical social worker on behalf of APA. She runs our, a number of our intimate uh, partner violence, and she's the lead on this program, so she can address a lot more technical issues. But we were so very pleased that Multnomah County DA's office, and under the leadership of Mike, was, was willing to step forward and say, yes, we want to address the issues of those who have been victimized, those who have been traumatized, and now are... Uh, getting uh, enveloped into the system, how do we keep them out? So congratulations to, to the DA, congratulations to Multnomah for pulling this program off. And I'm Liz, I'm not sure who I'm supposed to pass. Um, Aviva, did you have any remarks that you wanted to give? I wasn't sure. I just, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. It's been a really wonderful past, um, I think it's been about eight months. We've been meeting every other week with um, Jeff and his team, with Bradley Engel, and um, the work that they've put in has been incredibly thoughtful. And we're working together to provide any supports that they need and really try to make this program something very specific and adapted to the needs of, of your jurisdiction. And it's not something that we want to come in and sort of um, plug and play but working with you all to make it fit your your community. Thank you so much. Great, and now we'll turn to Bree Condon with Bradley Engel. Thank you everyone for being here today. I prepared some short comments. So I'll start by just saying that physical and emotional violence against women of color is pervasive on both an individual and an institutional level in a society that implores this tactic frequently to control the feminine, past and present. All individuals, especially those who have been exposed to gender-based violence, deserve the right to defend themselves against harm without the threat of jail time. It's important that Bradley Engel is still standing after 49 years to combat common abuse tactics put upon survivors and stop the cycle of violence in its tracks. At Bradley Engel, we employ 35 staff many of whom are survivors of domestic violence themselves, who run five survivor-centered community-based programs and lead the West Coast's oldest domestic violence shelter. When survivors flee violence, we assist through safety planning, housing, and resource navigation, whether it's to offer safe and stable nights in our emergency shelter, short and long-term rental assistance, match savings accounts, debt relief, food assistance, and survivor-focused advocacy in a targeted effort to build back up a person's internal assets after abuse. We have been grateful to learn from the wisdom of Doris O'Neill at the YWCA in King County and her partnership with the King County's DA office. That original team has served as true pathfinders in this work, and we hope to bring our organization's skill set into the fold here alongside the Multnomah County District Attorney's office. Thank you. Great. Uh, with that, we are open for questions. If you could just use the Raise your hand function and we'll be able to get to you. Right, we'll start with Lillian. Thanks. Um, this sounds interesting, but I'll be honest, I'm a little unclear about exactly what the details are going to look like. Could you walk me through maybe a hypothetical case of somebody who would benefit from this program? Yeah, maybe um, Jeff Oxier might be able to answer that. He's the head of our domestic violence unit. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, this is a, 
a hypothetical scenario, um, but one that I've used a lot to illustrate this program. Um, uh, police officers have a duty under Oregon law to arrest uh, domestic violent suspects whenever they have probable cause to believe they committed a crime. Um, that person, unlike other criminal acts, they have to take that person to jail um, and they have to spend the night. Um, sometimes um, scenarios come up where the officer has probable cause to arrest a person for, let's say, a misdemeanor domestic violence crime like scratching their husband. Every element of that crime is met. The law is clear. That person does need to go to jail. But the morning after that arrest, we as prosecutors have the ability to look at that uh, person's uh, history, um, past instances, and where the, the, um, they were the victim of abuse. And we can learn through court records and other sources that the person was arrested is really a survivor of domestic violence. And the person who was legally a victim of the crime that, that night um, is an abuser. Um, those are cases that we shouldn't be prosecuting. Um, we shouldn't have been prosecuting before. Um, it, no judgment on the police officer's decision to make an arrest in the field. That's not an unreasonable decision under the circumstances. But what this program does is create a system where we are going to be better and more informed at finding these survivors, uh, uh, these survivor defendants, as we call them in the program, and referring them expeditiously to the ser services of a community-based nonprofit to make sure that they get the help they need rather than have their case be prosecuted unnecessarily in the justice system. Did that, help, did that help Lillian? It did. And so at that point, you would refer the person directly to um, Bradley Engel. Is that right? Correct. In lieu of criminal prosecution. Okay. So uh, one commonly used term we're hearing a lot these days is deflection. Um, this would be a deflection program. Um, we do also have David Martin from the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office here. Uh, we modeled the pro we are modeling the program after their program. And I don't know, David, if you might be able to offer some insights into the, you know, how it works on your end. Yeah, it's it's very similar. And and thank you for having me. It's great to see uh, colleagues from Multnomah who I've worked with for a long time through the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys Domestic Violence Committee, uh, which both of our offices are longstanding members. Uh, I'm just really excited that Multnomah is engaged in trying to build their own version of this program, as is Nashville and other places. This started for us several years ago through our partnership with the YWCA. That um, the Y, and I'm sorry that my colleague Doris couldn't be here today, the Y would identify cases just like what Jeff was talking about and, and clients who they had been working with for a long time, and they would be caught up in the criminal justice system, sometimes for domestic violence charges, sometimes for other unrelated things that are related to their trauma, uh, but weren't readily apparent to everyone. And they would contact my office and ask for a second look. And we would do that and we would consistently find that the why was correct, right? That, that there was a whole lot of other things that were going on directly related to that individual's prior victimization. And so over time, we thought, well, we should try and kind of do something about it. And we took inspiration from a lot of the other diversion programs and deflection programs that happen, like drug court and veterans court that we have in my community, mental health court, and a program we have called LEAD. All of those programs began kind of decades ago, uh, and they were serving different parts of our communities, uh, but they weren't really serving victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and trafficking. Um, and so this was a way that we found through deflection that we could engage the YWCA and provide really great services. It's a program that my state has funded uh, for the past few years uh, and that we've continued to build and try to become like a normal part of our work, just in the same way the drug court is, in the same way the veterans court is. It has a lot of similarities to those programs. Great. Thank you, David. Uh, do we have more yes. questions? If there's not a question, this is Dave Lebon. If, yep. if I may be allowed to comment. Absolutely. 
okay, assuming that's fine. I, I wanted to point out in the, in the phrases that have been thrown out, uh, deflection, diversion, and um, diff different measures or using the broad phrase criminal justice reform. I wanted to point in this situation, this is someone who has been a victim of a crime. And a result of that crime, now they have got themselves involved in other criminality. This is all about public safety. I know in, in different areas, diversion has gotten a bad name. This is not that situation. This is one that can't we do better for the victims of violence to help address that and get them into the community and make the community safer and better. So I, I just wanted to add that if that's all right. Thank you. Um, let's see, we have a question from Annette Newell. Hi, I wondered if you could tell me about how many people would be affected by this program in the Portland metro area? How many victims of domestic violence could be impacted by this? I'm going to turn to Jeff. Do you have a sense, Jeff Oxier? Yes, um, but that hard to say for sure. Um, the, one thing that I've I've said a lot is really this is codifying a practice that should have existed already, right? Um, but I do think sometimes it takes the imposi imposition of a formal policy that to you know remind us all to be actively looking for these situations where a DV survivor um, is charged um, unjustly for a, a, a particular crime, and the best interest of public safety would be to not. Uh, prosecute that particular person. Um, um, we are one of the exciting things about this program is we are partnering with a um, uh, graduate program um, in statistics to sort of analyze um, what whether or not this program that we're we're embarking on gets better results than before. Um, um, better public safety results, the same public safety results, worse public safety results. We're holding ourselves accountable. We're going to find out uh, how this uh, how this how this works in future years. In the course of that um, uh, partnering with that graduate program, um, we um, we we have identified past cases that we think could have been eligible. And if I recall, um, over the last ten years, there were approximately uh, 500 ca cases that uh, we we believed could have been eligible for this program. Right, and I I won't speak for your office, but right, we look backward retrospectively, as Jeff said, who might have been eligible, um, and then we're going to be collecting data moving forward. Um, and I also just want to say, and I know. Um, David Martin can speak to this in terms of how his program grew. Um, we're really looking at this as starting out. It's a pilot project. We want to pilot it, um, work out any kinks, and then ramp things up as um, the program gets going and as both Jeff's office and Bradley Angle can handle uh, the cases coming in. Yeah, and I'll, this, is, this is David Levon. I'm, I'm going to jump in and identify the research partner because they're part of our grant. So it's Bowie State University uh, here out of Maryland who, who is reviewing and looking for the baseline as, as far as where we're going, both for uh, Portland as well as Nashville. And secondly, I want to point out that because of the grant, this is not costing Multnomah County anything. Uh, they, they, they do not uh, pay towards this effort or pay towards the researcher. But everything we do at APA, we want to make sure that we're improving the safety. That's why we'll look to the baseline, and then we'll have something to compare it to. Great. Any other questions? We have a few minutes. Lillian? Sorry, sometimes my hand just works better than the, hand, the little I hand thought. that I can't find on the... Um, on the money, how much does this all come to? How much is the grant for, and how much of that will be Multnomah County specific? Uh, I think uh, David and Mike, do you have a sense? I don't. I I don't think that there's actually a cost necessarily tied to this. We're doing this within existing resources. Is that correct? 
Je yeah, Jeff, if you want to address that, but um, yeah. our grant money, yeah, is paying for the support end of it and the research end of it. Um, Jeff, you can talk about it from your office. No, that, that's correct. I think this is, um, I, I don't see there being additional, um, if anything, there's, we, there's the potential for cost savings as a result of us focusing our resources on um, the people who are truly public safety risks. And, and I believe this is David LeBon again, and Aviva can correct me. I believe the grant itself is 500,000 for two years. Um, none of the money, we're, we're not paying Multnomah to be a part of the project either. The, the money is entirely going to the training technical assistance and research uh, component. So there is no, no, no money being passed to the county, but we're not seeking anything from the county um, because it's a very exciting program uh, working with the victims. And I think Jeff made the comment, it's been a long time coming because there, there's been that frustration of our victims who get themselves in trouble. Yeah, Elizabeth, I just wanted to add in one point. I mean, it, it really makes me think that one of the one of the huge benefits of this program, um, I mean, yes, there's the cost feature and, and all of that kind of not having people involved in the legal system, but the the enormous benefit is so many of the of the victims and survivors that we're seeing in this program are the most marginalized. They are primarily women of color. They are those who are in the justice system facing charges, and so they're deeply marginalized at multiple different levels, more marginalized than a lot of the victims that I've seen doing this work for a long time. And as a result of being marginalized, they're not, not empowered, and they're not getting, um, they're not able to connect with community services in the same way that others who are less marginalized are. And here, this ability to connect very quickly in the work that Bradley Angle is doing to kind of reach out and connect with people is is different. And that's what the Y, the YWCA in King County uh, really did an amazing job with. It's, uh, they didn't wait for people to call them. They would do outreach and they would build relationships and trust. And through that, they were able to connect with those who are really marginalized. And uh, it's been remarkable to see the, the results of that of that type of collaboration, that type of support. Uh, and that's just not something that happens regularly within a lot of justice systems in the United States. And that's kind of the, the lessons that were taken from the support that was given with programs like drug court and veterans court and other things. And we're just applying those same lessons uh, to survivor defendants. All right, any other questions? Last call. All right. Well, if you do have any follow-ups, uh, you know how to get a hold of me. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you for all our speakers. Um, and we're excited to provide updates as we get going. So thank you, everyone.